Me golpearon y no supe absolutamente nada qué pasó conmigo porque cuando desperté estaba en una casa abandonada tirada en el suelo y entonces desnuda y, a, y con mi niña también sin ropa. Nos tomaron un video. Hacían cabañitas clandestinas y ahí era de bailar desnudas para los hombres. Y como yo daba pecho, la leche se estaba en mi cuerpo. Nos hacía que nos sentáramos en las piernas de ellos y para mí eso era bien duro porque eso era el, el enfoque de todo mi sufrimiento. Que yo fuera, que me estuvieran prostituyendo. It's, it's been a long process for me. I, I did, in the process, I did a short that is now is sold in America, that is now in, in festivals. And, um, but I wanted to do a longer piece. And this is supposed to be my longer piece, Sense of Silence. And during the process, since I started first as a journalist, I was a journalist before coming into the documentary filmmaking world, um, I really specialized in social issues and women's issues and then basically in, in, in sex trafficking, human trafficking, but more specifically in sexual trafficking. And it's an issue that has been coming to me again and again th during the years, the past since, for the past 13 years or more. I have been working first writing, uh, I started writing in Nepal about, about this issue, uh, about sex trafficking in the Himalayas, women, uh, young girls that were trafficked from Nepal into India, etc., etc., and um, since that time, working on this issue, I realized that I ha I've come to understand why am I doing this documentary? Why am I doing these documentaries or this? I'm writing about it. Why am I so? I feel so passionate about the, the subject, and then I realized that I've, after going through a crisis, when you do a documentary film, you go through many crises. In one of those points of crisis. Um, really, I had to do a lot of introspection, and I realized that the reason why I'm doing this is because uh, since I was a little child, I've been very, um, I would say, like outraged at the condition of women and at the, the superiority of men over women, and how women are so, are we, how we are so vulnerable in the face of uh, men's sexuality and their needs in general. And um, there was something that happened when I was little that I was a witness of. It didn't happen to me, but I was a witness of. It happened very close to me. And, and that really influenced me. And I didn't know all these years. I've kept that with me, but I didn't know until recently, you know, that that was really the driving force, that there is something in me that was outraged, that was, that was really uh, touched or hurt in me and that I need to heal that, that wound um, by helping other women to heal their wounds. And I thought, or I've, I've experienced that by talking to women and by giving them a voice, uh, I, they go through a process of healing. It's very beneficial for them. Sometimes it's difficult because they can feel, they can feel a little bit re-victimized, but overall it's a very positive experience for them to come to terms to, to what happened to them when they were sexually assaulted, raped, uh, victimized, or sexually trafficked. The most interesting thing for me when I was, after working and interviewing many, many women and many young girls in, in Nepal that had been, you know, enslaved in India as sex workers uh, or as sex slaves, these girls that sometimes would try to escape from through the sewage and they would be apprehended by the police and return to the brothel owners because the police is totally corrupt and in general and they would get bribed by the brothel keepers to bring the girls back so there is like there was no escape from for them for the girls unless they would uh, when they fell sick then of course nobody wants them and then they send them up to the streets some die in the streets some are able to make it back to, to Nepal. But they, when they come back to their countries, they cannot 
uh, reintegrate into society. That's the huge problem. Uh, and, and the most interesting thing for me was when then I came to America, came back home here, and then I started to research what is happening with um, human trafficking in, here in Los Angeles, in California, in the US. I realized that women and girls that are trafficked um, uh, from Mexico and Latin America, they have the same problems that the women that have been that are being trafficked in, in Asia. And usually in developing countries, the cultures of the, the family culture is such that um, they wouldn't accept you if you have been staying by sleeping with a man that is not your husband. And the moment a, a girl is even raped, like in Mexico, in Central America, the moment the girl is, is raped, is considered dirty and the, the families don't accept them. Much less the women that have been trafficked and exploited in, in prostitution. So what I think is, why don't we understand that if we are planting the seeds for these people to want to come here where we have a better life and we have all the bigger cars and bigger televisions and we have good education. We're planting the seeds. Why are we using them? Why are we selling them any good, including Coca-Cola? Why are we selling them McDonald's? Why are we infecting them with our, with our society, with our ways of, of living? And then telling, yes, but you can do that. You can buy this television, keep it in your house, but you cannot, you cannot come here. You cannot want more. Those people that know how we live, they're not going to stay in Mexico, in Central America, or in whatever, in Nepal, or in Thailand, if they see that the neighboring countries are prospering. Of course they're going to go there. Of course globalization is happening, and of course migration is going to continue to happen. So what is the fence? A stupid band-aid that is not doing absolutely anything except getting the people closer to the desert and having more people die in the desert. Why? Because is unstoppable. Excuse me, open the eyes. This is unstoppable. So why don't we create laws that accommodate that unstoppable flux of migration? Why don't we establish a guest worker program that allows for some people to come and then tell, okay, now you have to wait. Oh yeah, there will be people who will still try to come, but they will be, we will create a tampon, a situation in which at least we're working with, with that flux in, 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 and we are using our common sense, not you know, very tough laws that don't, that are totally contra counterproductive because what happened, the influence of those laws, <laughs> going to your question, into sex trafficking is that they, they make, they make uh, migration illegal, illegal, underground, they push it farther underground, and then the girls that are subject, or the, or the boys sometimes that are trafficked, everybody who is trafficked, sometimes even men are trafficked here for labor purposes, all those people are even underground, more underground, and we cannot reach them. Nobody can reach them. The, the, the civic society, the non-profits, they cannot even reach them because how are you going to get to them? How can I get, how can I, can, how can, excuse me, how can they get the, the, the help, the resources they need to either go back to their countries or to reintegrate here or to everybody as a, as a mature society sit down and say, okay, what do we do? How do we face this problem? but it's not those tough laws that are going to make it.